became acquainted with the Course of Miracles in New Zealand about six years ago, and I've been I've done the course once, but I've gone through the course once, and picked in pieces ever since. Um, not rigidly sticking to the course day by day, but um, keeping it in mind. I haven't I haven't done the course twice, and I think you need to do it twice thoroughly. But um, I'm glad that I was able to attend courses. <laughs> 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 that's it. Okay, that's. So I don't know anything about it. <laughs> Very good. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He's not even seen it. The book. Very yeah. good. This is, this is my, <laughs> typical of my gathering. That people walk in. Wow, this is fun, but I don't know <laughs> anything about it. That's all right. It's not like uh, you studied for twenty years. You never heard of it. It's the same love. <laughs> I haven't even seen the book. Yeah. yeah. Here it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's quick. And there's a lot of it. There'll be a test in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Linda, and I picked up the book first, it was 19, <clears throat> 1990, and I was doing a lot of rebirthing at the time, and it went with sort of the whole rebirthing LRT tradition and I was blown away and I didn't pick up any other book I'd say for five years, that's all I read. Mm -hmm. And I would have gone through the lessons, all of them maybe three times, but I don't need, I don't know that you need to go through that many times, mm -hmm. I think you can get it yeah. or not, I didn't get it that way, thought I did. Yeah. And then, mm -hmm. then I'd read it again, I was like, whoa, I didn't get anything. Um, I haven't picked it up in a long time, I don't pick it up anymore, but I picked it up thoroughly and there was no group around Cork where I was, so I kind of, evolved into other areas and um, I spent a lot of time in India. I spent time in India last year and sort of into the ashram tradition. But I still know Course in Miracles is my core place. Yeah. I know that deeply. And so whatever I'm doing <coughs> is translating it in course terms and there is only one truth and there is only mm -hmm. one way. Mm -hmm. So I met David in Belgium two years ago yeah. and it's very exciting to be here. It's great. Yeah. So I'm excited. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my name's Gemma Donnelly and I'm from Belfast as well. Um, I came to the course, um, no, I shouldn't even say that. I picked up the book last year and tried to read a bit of it. That was okay, that didn't really work. <laughs> um, but I did try, but I put it down again. And I picked it up again this year, say about three months ago. And I have been reading a few pages every day doing some of the workbook every day, having to go back and read the pages again because you miss a lot of it and go back again and reread and so And I find that not difficult, but it's slow going for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm really here this weekend because there's lots of people in the room who have way more knowledge than I do and I'm here to learn something mm -hmm. and to have a bit of crack as well. That's an interesting word, David. You know, we, as well as... Oh, yeah. We might have the crack. <laughs> now, the crack is having fun yes. and having joy yes. and having... Oh, yes! <laughs> 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 it's not cracker, you know? I'm just getting the interpretation. Right, right, right. I'm here for the drugs. Tom will do the Irish translation. Right, okay. Crack and kill. Okay. That's why I'm here. The next one we want, Sarah. Sarah. Um, hi everyone, um, my name is Sarah, um, I live in Tipperary and um, I came to the course about six years ago. Um, I thought I was ordering another kind of self-development book that had been referenced through other self-development books I'd read and then when I got it I tried to return it. I said, sorry, um, I think you sent me the wrong book, do you have this by another author, the same title? <laughs> and she went, no, there's only one. I went, Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I thought I was getting indoctrination into a cult and years later when I met my friend Linda she said yeah, cult of one. <laughs> so yeah. I found that there was cult not such a strong outside influence True. that I couldn't withstand it seeing as I was just reading a book so I went with it and um, so that's about six years and to be honest it, for me, it, it saved my thought process which was so ingrained in 
um, I suppose like a victimhood thing like a lot of us have but it was that all the world was miserable and everything but this book agreed with me that all the world was miserable but it was going to show me a new way to look at it and so yeah. that was yeah. wonderful yeah. to find yeah. 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 And next we have Jenny okay. and it's going to be a long story because she's a very interesting lady <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, put yourself on camera. I'm gonna try. That's nice. You can put yourself into the film. You can see if you find that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I have had uh, read the course in two years. Uh, it started the year before with I, I started to get very strong direct um, guidance to do certain things, and I was guided to go to a gathering with a, a lady in Sweden. And she shared her life story, and it was very powerful. And I just felt after that, oh, I need to, I need to know more. <laughs> it's she, she, she knows something. She has something that I want to ex experience and explore. So I just called her up and I asked her, okay, uh, is there something I can read? And she said, mm, what about um, conversations with God? She said. I said, no, I've read them and I, 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 I want something else, something more. And she said, oh, of course, in miracles. And that just came straight into my heart. And okay, it's, that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was the Holy Spirit just telling me yes. And so I ordered it. And by that time, I was uh, into psychology studies. So I thought I, I, I would be a psychologist. But when I started to read the course, was the only thing I could read. It just um, captured me. So uh, uh, I had to quit my psychology studies, and that was after I had met David during uh, the summer 2006. Uh, I decided to quit my psychology studies, and I started the course, and I was just meditating uh, on my own for maybe three months, and just prayed and asked God what should I do with my life? I had quit my education, which was the closest I could come to uh, in the world. <laughs> so what, what I uh, thought I was. So uh, it was very um, disorienting too, to not know what I would do. So uh, I just prayed for, for months. And then it came a, an invitation to go to the United States a very strong calling, so uh, maybe I can tell you more about that later. It was very, uh, yeah, very, very strong experiences from that. I was guided to go to a meditation center to meditate for eight hours a day uh, for half a year or, or a whole year, but after three weeks <laughs> Uh, I was uh, guided again to, to, to go to David instead. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, about the course, and I don't really study, I, I, I mean, I read it through twice when I first got it and I did the lessons, but uh, now I'm not really uh, doing so much reading or lessons. How are you teaching us? Thanks, Amy. No, David, your turn. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was in university for ten years, from uh, 1976 to 1986, and it was very much a time of <coughs> searching for me. Like when I was in much younger in high school, I people would say, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" Uh, and I was always fascinated that people would even know, even as children, they would say, I want to be a fireman, or I, and when you get into high school, I want to study and take this course. I had nothing coming at all, and I thought that was very strange, I felt very odd. And I would take aptitude tests in high school, and for interest, and your strengths, and abilities, and you know, your education, it would, the scores would look like a, like a spokes of a, of a wheel, just there was nothing correlating, and so the guidance counselors were trying to come up with something. Because I had, I had a lot of strengths, I got very good grades, and I had a lot of abilities and aptitudes, but then when they would try to coordinate 
those abilities and aptitudes with my interests, it would just give this picture that was almost like that I wasn't supposed to be anything in this world. <laughs> and, was, and that is not what guidance counselors, you know, they're like, ah. And my mother was a teacher in the same school, so she was like, come up with something, you know, help, this, help my son, you know, find something. He's very talented and he's skilled and he's very quiet and timid and he's contemplative and reflective, but, but nothing's pointing him in a direction. They would send me off to, you know, like engineer for a day or the Rotary Club to, to look at politics or they did really <coughs> bent over backwards to try to find something that would be something. But basically the scores were saying that I was supposed to be nothing. Uh, and that was kind of like, in this world, is like, no, that's not an acceptable answer. <laughs> when you have a lot of skills and abilities, you can't just decide to be nothing, or be a vegetable or something, you know. It's when people are put into hospitals after an accident and they can't do anything, then you're allowed to be nothing. <laughs> but you're not supposed to be nothing. So, after ten years of university and searching through many, many philosophies and books and reading a lot of books, psychology, philosophy, religion, and, and taking studies and everything that the world had to offer, uh, a very kind of eclectic, uh, general background where I really got to see that everybody was looking at the different world, that the psychologists were not looking at the same world as the scientists, and the scientists were not looking at the same world as the artists. Uh, that everybody had different assumptions, which seemed very confusing to me, like how, how would we ever have peace and harmony if, if no two people see the same world? If everybody is so uniquely different and sees a different world, I thought, how are we ever going to have peace and harmony? And I was really interested in peace and harmony, and then I felt this voice within <coughs> me saying, it's not their problem, it was saying, it's, it's your problem, it's your perception, you're seeing everything in a fragmented way. You're seeing separate people, separate interests, and there is a, a harmony and a oneness and a truth that's way beyond this. But the problem is with your own mind and your own thinking. Uh, don't ever point the finger or don't ever think that anybody's got it or doesn't have it outside of you. You know, it's all your own lesson. So that's when this thing started with all your own lesson. Every time I would say, but, but this person yelled and how this person, they don't seem to be very sensitive enough. It's your lesson, Dave. It's your lesson. So then after 10 years of university, uh, I really didn't know where my life was going to go at that point because I didn't feel guided into a career and I didn't feel any clear sense of what my life was to be. But it seems like that was part of how the plan was to go so that then when the A Course in Miracles came into my life, it's like I just I just went to a humanistic psychology conference out in California. I was going to many different uh, presenters. It was all very wonderful. And yet I had picked where I would go, my workshops, and then suddenly I met these people who had A Course in Miracles book, and when I opened it up, it was just like, I had a strong tickle experience in my heart, a lot of energy, and felt like a giant tsunami of love, just like waves of love pouring over me. And somehow that, that I had found it, whatever I had been searching for, it was like A Course in Miracles was like the unspoken prayer of my heart was answered with A Course in Miracles for a systematic way of reaching peace of mind, inner peace, or enlightenment or truth or self-realization. It goes by many names and many different traditions. And so, and I knew my whole life would change. Whatever vector I was on, whatever trajectory I was heading on in my life, I knew that it was suddenly that everything had shifted from my encounter with this book and that my whole life I just felt like, oh my life will never be the same. And that's exactly how it has felt. Uh, I. I was, unlike Sarah, when I picked it up, I had kind of developed quite a bit of discernment so that here we are in a library, I could, I could pretty much pick up any book on the shelf and I had done so much reading and so much inner discerning that I could pick up any book and just thumb through it and look at the ideas and say, hmm, this author's underlying assumptions are they believe in this, this, this and this about the world. Pick up another one. Hmm. This author believes in this, this, this. Uh, 
And so I could pick up any book and discern what the author's underlying assumptions were. Then I picked up the Course, and I looked in there, and it was like I lost my breath. Uh, I, I had to work hard to formulate a question, one question, with, which was only four words, <laughs> which was, who wrote this book? <laughs> it took a lot of effort to get four words out because it, the feeling was that the author was not on this planet. This was not one of the six billion earthlings that was walking around, that this was a, a, divine, a divine author. I mean, even having read the Bible, you know, you can read things that resonate in your heart, and then there's some things that kind of maybe were passed down and interpreted, and you know, they did the best that they could at the time, but it doesn't, not everything in the Bible had a resonance for me. But with this book, it was like, oh my gosh, this is like some kind of a scripture from a divine being. And I thought to myself, first of all, oh my gosh, I, I don't have any excuses now. I mean, I felt before that I would pop open books or hear a song on the radio or that the Spirit was speaking to me in many ways, hundreds of ways, where I would get little nuggets of gold every day. And I, would, I was like panhandling and getting nuggets. And I was quite happy to be a, a panhandler to shake the thing and get, oh, what do we got here? Oh, look at these nuggets of truth that were resonating with my heart. But it was like with this book, it was like, it wasn't getting nuggets. It was like I was under the earth and I had a giant vein of gold, like you've tapped into the mother load. Of, <laughs> like this isn't nuggets at all. This is like, oh my God, this is from a divine being. And the feeling was, I have no excuse now, because before I would always say to Spirit, you know, could you make it a little more obvious, uh, you know, why should it be so slow and tedious? Uh, can't there be a direct pathway to God? Or if you're going to have to lay aside judgment, like Jesus said, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, judge not, lest ye be judged. It's a very simple teaching, except for 2,000 years people have been saying, it sounds good, sentimentally, <laughs> I would love to stop judging. I would love to be accepting and, and just whole and complete and, and totally love everyone, universally and unconditionally. But, practically speaking, it seems like in this realm of human beings, that that's the teachings of Buddha and Jesus and Krishna and Muhammad and all these great prophets and teachers, they seem to be very hard to put into practice. But sentimentally, people resonate with them. They'd say, they, they sound really good. I would love to be able to, to say that and mean that without having this, this anger cutting underneath or this hurt, woundedness coming up and saying, no, no, it's not so. It's a lie. So, that began in, in 1986 uh, when I first came in contact with the Course. That be began a spiritual adventure where I for the first two and a half years, I read the book about an average of around eight hours a day. Uh, it was like somebody, I was, I was drowning in the ocean uh, and somebody threw me a life jacket and uh, just with a rope and just it was tied to a big ship and just said, here, just quit trying to struggle and swim. Just put yourself in the life jacket and be carried along. And I was like, thank God, thank you. And then, uh, for me, it resonated so much. I didn't read the, the Course eight hours a day consecutively, because I had still too much... I had great resonance with it, but it's like the ego within me was... Uh, it was like uh, kryptonite to Superman, you know. It was... the ego was like, no more, please, uh, after I would read for a couple hours. My eyelids would... it was get very heavy, like lead weights, just like... The ego saying, shut down, you know, please, no more. And it was resistance uh, to this bright, bright light that was dispelling everything I believed about the world. And so I would take, I would ask the Spirit what to do and take a nap, have some fruit, go for a walk, have a swim, something very gentle and relaxing, like you would expect from, from love. Something soft, <laughs> yeah, very, very soft and light and gentle, and then I would come back after an hour or two, three hours, 
and I would open the book again, usually with a question I had, like, well, what about this? Ah, <laughs> there's the answer again. Then I would get so interested in, I would read way beyond the answer. I would just, I wasn't reading the book even chronologically, I was just using it kind of like an oracle, uh, like a lot of people do, to give me spontaneous answers to my questions. So, that went on for about two and a half years, and then um, I just, felt like in the late 1980s uh, that I said, oh, there must be some other people that work with this book, even though it was just kind of like me and the Spirit working with it. It was a very intimate thing between the Spirit and I. It wasn't like a, a group or a convention or anything like that. And then suddenly I, I looked in my area, I went to a retirement home where there was a student uh, speaking on the course, and suddenly I met all these people from Ohio and Kentucky and Indiana, and suddenly I had a whole group of people I knew who studied the book, and I was going to five Course in Miracles groups uh, a week. Uh, yeah, so I went from, like they talk about the, the cars that go from zero to fifty in, in 4.9 seconds or something. I went from zero, not knowing anybody in my area who studied the Course, to the Spirit saying, now it's time for phase two. Uh, you have learned how to hear my voice. Uh, and I could hear it very distinctly and clearly, as the voice of Jesus and the Holy Spirit guiding me, like having a little bird on your shoulder and telling you, go back, you forgot your keys, call so-and-so, go here, go there. It was like the small, still voice that they talk about in all the spiritual traditions. And certainly over here in Ireland, with the Celtics and the, the, the many mystics here in Ireland have always spent a deep spiritual tr Christian tradition in mysticism, and I was hearing this voice so clear, <clears throat> and the voice was saying, well, okay, now you can hear me very clearly. Now the next phase is I want to speak through you, which was a big step for me, because I was very shy and timid, and was always told, you know, don't, don't talk in public about God or politics, <laughs> uh, unless you want a lot of trouble, you should never talk about, and this was like, it was more like God within me, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit saying, I want to speak through you. And the ego is going, oh my God, this is the worst nightmare, to be shy and to start going around and talking. It would be like going on Oprah Winfrey uh, and talking about God or something, when you're so shy that you don't even have many friends, you've never participated in any social groups, you were voted most quiet in your senior class <laughs> of, of the entire uh, male population, you were voted the most right of the entire 200 and some odd people. You know, it was, it was really like a huge leap. And yet I did find myself going to Course in Miracles groups. It wasn't like I was a, a student of the Course initially in the sense that I would show up and I was so happy and I, everything was so clear in my mind, after reading it for eight hours a day for two and a half years, I had actually done what some preachers and ministers do with the Bible. I had memorized the book. And you saw the book. It's not a few, it's not a leaflet. <laughs> it's, it's over 1,200 pages. And I, I knew all the lessons, and I, I could, I would be at a course group, I would pop in on, and I would sit there and, and they would be talking about something, and they would say, there's something in the book about this, and I would start off reciting sentence by sentence, word by word, the whole paragraph, and then give the page number, and they would all just go, because <laughs> they were struggling with uh, even getting through the paragraph, and they couldn't retain what they had just read, and I would give the whole paragraph and the page number, this was the first edition when it first came out, and, and uh, they, one of my friends, Mary, she just was like, huh, we got a real joker here, and they'd go and they'd look it up and they'd go, they go, and they would read it word by word and the page number, and they'd go, they thought I was joking, because uh, I, I was quoting the book by paragraph. They thought, there's no way, there's absolutely no way he's quoting this book. But that's what was happening. So, after a few years, I started meeting people. I was, I was guided to, to just leave everything behind. Like Jesus uh, had told the apostles, you know, take no thought for what you should wear, what you should eat. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, all things else. I was raised in Christianity, so I'd heard these biblical teachings, but they seemed kind of far off. It would be like, how do you apply that in, the, in this century? 
You know, it's like that's 2,000 years ago. It's, it's not practical. And Jesus is saying in my mind, oh, oh, it's practical. Uh, I'm here and I'm going to perform miracles through you and you are a miracle worker. And even though I protested that I was not ready and how could you have chosen me and all the typical things, you know, he was like saying, no, you are ready now. And I will perform miracles for you. Sure, sure. When you say that you, you heard the voice, you, you were hearing the voice, was it just like a thought in your mind or did you actually hear words? It was very much like the scribe of A Course in Miracles, Helen Shuckman. She didn't hear an audible voice and neither did I hear like, like a voice, like a voice, a human voice uh, speaking to me through what would be like through the ears. Mm -hmm. It was, it was like a very clear, distinct thought pattern in my mind that was very, very gentle, that could take on any kind of sound. It could sound like David or it could sound like a man or a woman. It was a very distinct uh, stream of thoughts that was very much like a conversation, like you and I talking. It wasn't like the committee was meeting and we were trying to talk in a crowded train station. <laughs> what did you say, Christine? What did you say, David? Like typically all the chatter in people's minds, they hear many voices or the committee meets and the opinions and everything goes. But this was a very clear, like a clear stream of thoughts. It was not audible, but it was like somebody on the inside of my mind talking to me. And then talking through me, uh, where I would just kind of relax and then the words would start to come out in an audible way. So it did take on an audible sound, but it was using these vocal cords. And so, I had read about the prophets of the Bible, you know, John the Baptist and Isaiah and the, a voice crying out in the wilderness, you know, telling the people, turn from your ways, repent, and, and God loves you, and different things. But certainly when I was being raised, I was not thinking, oh, what would I be when I grow up? Oh, I'll be a prophet or a mystic or a saint. That was not on the table. Uh, that's, definitely my parents weren't saying that that was an option. And none of my teachers ever said, oh, you could be a prophet. Uh, you know, it didn't come out in the test scores. It never came out in the test scores. <laughs> the test scores were more, you know, you're not going to be anything else. You're not going to be a construction worker or a sociologist or a chemist. You know, you're, you're not going to be anything in the world, but it didn't articulate prophet or saint or mystic or, or scribe or all these things that, that we have. We have a lot of words, angels and Chandler, Angel Chandler, I mean nowadays with the New Age, there's a lot of names that are there, but none of these were like in, in high school on, yeah. those, it just wasn't there. So then, uh, in 1991, I was told, uh, you have worked your last job, it was a great job teaching psychology to Art Institute and having the Holy Spirit teach the class through me for four hours each class. Uh, it was a spectacular job for training to do what I would be doing, which I didn't know at the time what that would be. But I had to, to let the Course in Miracles come through and the Spirit teach about love and oneness and forgiveness without using the words forgiveness or, or oneness or Jesus or Holy Spirit in a psychological setting. It was perfect practice uh, to use all my ten years of education I could talk about curriculum and learning goals, I could talk about peace of mind and, and life and death and things like that, but I, I was not to use any religious symbols in a psychology uh, class. And that, that really prepared me for uh, going out and speaking around the world in 21 different countries and to people of many different languages, using many different symbols and metaphors and actually using the modern day parables, Jesus spoke in parables because it was so deep 2,000 years ago, I use movies from Hollywood and all over the world because we have a lot of mystical, metaphysical physical movies coming now and I can teach a whole group of people, for example in South America, a whole theater full with the Holy Spirit pouring through me and us watching a movie together and the Holy Spirit pouring through afterwards and we all have kind of mystical experiences together, like a whole theater full. Uh, I could have never imagined having that kind of an intense experience with a whole theater full of people 
But the Holy Spirit is like, oh yeah, no problem. Uh, we'll use a movie like Groundhog Day, uh, the one where he's caught in the loop and I'll pour through. And it was like, these young people, they were like 18, 19 years old, just glowing and beaming and coming up. I would show a movie like uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, down in South America, with Spanish subtitles and Spanish translators. And to see a couple of like 20 years old who had been struggling with all these relationship issues, and then afterwards they'd walk down from the theater and they'd look at me like, you have just demystified our entire relationship. You have, you have just given us like, like 20 years of counseling in one evening. Uh, and we said, they were like looking at each other with such love because, oh Sue, I put the box right there. <laughs> that was intuitive. <laughs> but it was like, they were like saying, oh my God, we've been struggling with our relationship issues and we thought it was hopeless, like we were not going to have any way to break through and you've just suddenly kind of in one evening you've cut through all of this relationship trouble and they were like blown away. And I said, yeah, that's the power of God. God. God is so powerful and mighty that He reaches us in our spirit here and we, and it's just like that song, you raise me up, you know, to all that I can be. It's just like lifting us higher and higher into this realm of perfect divine order that our hearts have been calling out for, we've been crying out for a sense of harmony and love and unity and and I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is the answer that I've been praying for. So I took off in 1991 with, I was guided to get this little three-cylinder car, a little Chevy Sprint that had good gas mileage and back then the price of gas was <laughs> I can't even remember, it was so low, <laughs> it's a number below that I can remember. <laughs> but I, I would be able to just go off and go, go, go for miles and miles, hundreds of miles in this little car and spontaneously be guided by the Spirit. You know, you know, had Jesus said, told the apostles, I will make you fishers of men. In other words, you will go out and cast your net far and wide and I will bring the whole human race back into the fold of love. Uh, you're not really going to convert anybody, you're not going to change anybody, you're, you're not to save anybody, to rescue anybody, you're not to correct anybody. Everybody's just perfect the way they are, you don't have to give them advice, and you don't even have to talk about this stuff unless they ask you. Like, unless they say, whoa, you are happy, you are so happy and joyful, what is going on? Or I've done television shows where friends of mine have said, David, look at you. Look at you on the television show. You look like you're stoned. You look like, <laughs> you look like you've just been, you've had crack. <laughs> you've been darling. <laughs> you're cracking with the crack. I mean, you, you look like, uh, you really look stoned and, and I'd say, I'm just being myself. And, and it was funny when they would say I was stoned because I had a life that was more like John the Baptist in the Bible. I didn't live in a cave and eat berries, but I didn't go out on my first date until I was 27 years old. That's unusual in this shy. world. <laughs> shy. That's a bit shy. That's a bit timid. Uh, and so that was unusual. And I didn't do dr drugs. I didn't smoke cigarettes. I didn't drink alcohol. Uh, it wasn't like I was raised in kind of like a, a strict religious order where you couldn't do any of it. I just didn't do any of it. Uh, I didn't drink alcohol. Uh, I remember one time I was with a friend, he said, here, have a sip of the beer, and I was like, taste the beer, mm, yeah. go back to the water and juice or whatever it was, or wine or anything. Really wasn't, I mean, occasionally I would have emotions come up, but I really wasn't into swearing and cussing and, you know, a whole blue streak of, of swear words or cuss words, you know, I didn't do that. It was like, I would have been like a model student maybe in the, the Catholic Church or something. <laughs> I, but I wasn't into Catholicism either. <laughs> I wasn't into vows and rituals and I was just kind of <coughs> quiet and contemplative and pondering. And I think behind all that pondering for all those 27 years before I even went out on my first date was, was there's something fishy with this world. I don't even know what it is, but there's something not right, something's amiss. I don't know what it is, 
and nobody's given me a straight answer. Nobody else knows either. <laughs> Everybody knows there's something fishy about this world, but nobody knows what it is. So, by the time, by that time, at 27, I always, well, the time I went on my first date was also the time I, I discovered A Course in Miracles, which was interesting timing for my first girlfriend. She was like, what are you on to? What? This is, she was a traditional Christian, and all I can think that The Course in Miracles must have been very threatening, most threatening for her, because she was raised with Jesus and Holy Spirit, and you get all your stuff in church from the Bible, not from some book that's saying that the world is an illusion and that it's all images and that God didn't create the world and that you've done this to yourself and now there's a way out. There's a way back to the kingdom of heaven or to nirvana or to oneness. But you have to forgive in a, in a different way than you've been trying to forgive. You've tried it before and it hasn't worked because you were poorly taught. You were taught by the ego how to forgive the ego. <laughs> You fell right into its trap of, of its own theologies and its own religions. And it didn't go anywhere, it just was like spinning your wheels in, in oil. How you weren't, didn't get any traction, you weren't having any movement. So, then I really felt that, uh, I started traveling in 2000, in, in 1991, and that's when the miracles, I was reading about miracles for the first five years. And I was having synchronicities, and I was having and questions were answered immediately, which I was thrilled about. But I didn't know the intensity of what a miracle was. Uh, I had been raised a Christian, of course, in Christianity, you know, walking on water and multiplying the fishes and the loaves and parting the Red Sea and, you know. Using mountains. <laughs> yeah. It was like, that was all miracles. And, and yet, I really didn't know the intense joy of, of miracles, which is what I was really wanting. You know, they were all, the synchronicities were all kind of a lead-in towards something that was much, much bigger. An actual experience. Not sitting in a course group and go, change your mind, change your perception. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's, that's nice, but it's like to tell somebody, just change your mind. Yeah. Just change your perception. Look at it differently. No! My boyfriend cheated on me! Don't tell me! <laughs> I changed my mind. I want to kill him! <laughs> you know, but, you know, this was like not sitting intellectually bantering around ideas. But when I was guided to start traveling, I was impelled almost from the inside like a giant wave was grabbing me and saying, you will you will now, you are now mine, the Spirit said, and you will travel wherever I guide you to, and everything will be taken care of. You will, Jesus told me, you will never charge a penny for anything you do. You will just accept donations and love offerings. That was, that was a bit steep, you know. I thought, I would talk back to Jesus, even though he was friendly, gentle. You will never charge a penny for anything you do. What about like counseling? Making a, a book, a booklet, a DVD, a cassette, something? No, 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 no. Uh, little consultation fee occasionally? No. Uh, you know, can I, uh, you know, is there any way I can just ask them to kind of, you know, you have to do this and this? No, 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 no. You will never charge any money for this. Freely you have received, freely you shall give, and everything shall be taken care of. I thought that was a bit extreme. I said, well maybe that's so in heaven, freely you have received and freely you shall give, but, but this is earth we're talking about. And I was still fairly young, I mean I was in my twenties, and I'm like thinking, this might be good for a short period of time, but he was saying, no, for your whole life you will never charge a penny for anything that you do. I thought, I don't understand. I don't understand how, how you can... freedom, isn't it? Yeah, I, I thought, I don't see how you can survive, I don't understand that. I would, I said, okay, see those trees out there, Jesus? The money does not grow on trees. I can't just wait until the bank account, or I have nothing left, and then just go out and go pick, 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 start picking the bills off of the trees or the coins, like the flower petals, uh, just picking coins. And Jesus said, yes, I know you don't believe that you will be taken care of. But I have told you, I said it in the Bible, 
I talked about the lilies of the field. Look at the lilies of the field. They neither spin nor toil, and not even all of Solomon is entirely like that. He said, I, I told you clearly in the Bible, I've told you for years to just trust me and I'll take care of everything. And no matter how radical it seems, this is what I'm doing right now. I'm saying the same thing. And then I came to a passage in The Course in Miracles and Jesus said, now read this, memorize it, sing this. Uh, sing it every day, you know. It was, the, the, it, it was uh, once you have accepted His plan, God's plan or the Holy Spirit's plan, once you have accepted His plan as the one function you would fulfill, there will be nothing else the Holy Spirit will not arrange for you without your effort. He will go before you, making straight your path, and leaving in your way no stones to trip on and no obstacles to bar your way. Nothing you need will be denied you. Not one seeming difficulty but will melt away before you reach it. You need take thought for nothing except the only purpose that you would fulfill. He said, I'm giving you your purpose. You're getting it all right here. It's a complete package. I'm there with you in your mind, I'm going to guide you step by step, and you, you won't have any difficulties as long as you stay tuned in to like my, my channel. It's like stay tuned in to this radio station. God FM. And, yeah, God, God FM, God AM. Maybe FM because it's not so much talk, it's more easy listening. <laughs> uh, uh, so it was like God FM and, and then just stay tuned in and then that's it. You have no more troubles, everything. Not one seeming difficulty, but will melt away before you reach it. That was, that was intense. That was like way beyond anything that I could ever imagine. Ah, oh, the voice of the child. <laughs> and a little child shall lead, shall lead them. Yeah. Papa, Mama. That's how I was. Papa, Mama. Sorry. No, we are great. We're loving the sound. Telling my kids Yes. Maria. And the little one. So anyway, then I thought, okay, so then I started uh, just following, and I felt impelled to travel, but I didn't have any kind of church affiliation. I had not much money in the bank. I, uh, I thought, hmm, no, we'll see how this travel goes then, because it's not really prudent. I had learned in this world it wasn't prudent to just go off traveling without money. That would be a, could be a dumb idea. Uh, in this world, and and there was a woman who had been in the convent from 14 to about 22, who had worked with me when I was a co-op student in university, and she had re-met me years later, and I was so happy that she just went, what happened to you? You aren't even the same person. It's like, you aren't even near what you were. What have you been doing? What have you been reading? I told her about The Course in Miracles. She got into it. And she was working three jobs, and she heard in her mind, quit all of your jobs, you're going with David on this first trip that he's taking, which was a big leap for her. And then there was a priest who heard that he was to come along too, but she, she and priest did not go along well. She, she had left the whole Catholic system because of the priest. <laughs> You've come not from the road trip. And, and she's like, <laughs> She was just, her mouth just dropped when I said, oh, Father John wants to go with us on the trip. She was just like, like, you've got to be kidding. I just got away from the whole priesthood thing. I'm not going on the road with a priest. Because she had, did not take her final vows as a nun. You know, she had left the, after, she's supposed to be like a bride of Christ at the end. And she had, she had left Jesus at the altar. And I told her, I said, well, I hate to tell you, but Jesus is back for you. And you don't leave. Jesus behind the altar. You may leave a man behind, but, but it's like, this one's not going away. This is, it's more like the, the horror movies, Freddy Krueger that never dies. Jesus, well, he really never dies. You may, you may try to leave him in the dust and he's like smiling at the next corner, like, no, he ain't going anywhere. So, she ended up, the priest ended up talking with her. I said, it's, the script is written, it's all perfect. It's already happened, so we can't have any conflict of this. Why don't you two just have dinner? And they had dinner, and the priest came to me and said, mm, I definitely am not supposed to be going <laughs> with you. But he gave her a donation after she quit her three jobs. The priest said, here's a 
a donation, you're supposed to go, and, and off we went. And there were so many miracles of being given a Urantia book. Uh, some of you might have heard of that. It's a book that the last section is the life and teachings of Jesus in great detail. It's a really a spectacular uh, book. Uh, but I went to Of Course in Miracles group at a church my first day of traveling, and I, I, the facilitator, would you please speak at our course group, and then afterwards the group was over, he said, would you speak at our next group? I thought, how strange to have two Course in Miracles groups back to back, why don't you just kind of consolidate? He said, no, this is a Urantia group. This was a book that, that gave the full life of Jesus, all of his trials, his temptations, more detail than the teachings of the Masters of the Far East or the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus Christ, just a, in tremendous detail, the life of Jesus, all of the temptations that he went through, how he had to apply divine principle like you and I do, you know, going through puberty. Yeah, we all made it through puberty, uh, some of us more, better than others, but it was like Jesus had to go through the same things in this world. He wasn't born perfect. He wouldn't be a very good role model if he just came here as deity and splashed into earth and said, all is love, all is God. Uh, how do you relate to that? It would be like an alien uh, coming from another world. Now he went through the same ego temptations that we did and he transcended them. So, so all of that was in that book. And then, then the miracles really started where it's like the joy became intense, I, I was taken care of, I was offered places to stay, offered money to put gas in my car, brownies and cookies like grandma would bake for you. I mean, it was like I met a blind man who was just so happy in spirit. I met hundreds of, of witnesses to God's love just by going out and not trying to have a plan, but just to, to follow the Holy Spirit's guidance moment by moment. The witnesses flooded into my awareness. Before I thought I knew what a synchronicity was, this was more like a fairy tale. Like, you know, where the prince, this happens to the prince, and then this happens to the princess, and it felt kind of magical, you know, we're in the land of Ireland with fairies and, you know, and angels and everything. Yes, that was what my life was. In the middle of the United States, I was having all these kind of mystical, magical experiences where it felt like, I don't have a life of my own, but I don't need a life of my own. Uh, if this is God's life for me, miraculously in this world, then so be it. I just wanted to be happy. And I was very happy. So this went on for a few years, and um, the travels, people started coming to me and calling me their teacher. An interesting phenomenon when somebody comes to you and says, you are my teacher. I was like, what? And they're like, I said, oh, this is that stuff in the teacher's manual, I guess. Uh, when, the, when the teacher is ready, the students appear. When the student's ready, the teacher appears. You are my teacher. I was like, hmm, oh, wow, I didn't, didn't plan on that. I'm just, I was just a shy boy from Cincinnati, that, not going around having students or whatever. They started to appear. We would have sessions like this to go into things very deeply, you know, every, every day, really. And uh, that began a, another phase, and those are just some of the early phases. That one only takes me like to the mid-1990s. Since then, um, it's opened up to the point where it's like in around 2003, through a lot of series of events, I was given frequent flyer miles, and I was, I was started to travel around the world in 2003. And so that brings it a little closer up to date. So for the last five years, I've just been accepting invitations. Like Tom said, I think we were in Belgium and you just were sitting there one day. And we were talking, when, you come down, when you come to Ireland, I want you to come to Ireland. And so I thought, hmm. It, it just felt like a yes, a, a big strong yes. And so that brings us up to how I seem to be here with you all for this uh, weekend. Uh, through Monday morning, who can stay. If you would like, uh, we have the whole weekend, so basically, as Tom was saying, we don't really have a structure. Uh, we want this to be the most impactful weekend. If you've never heard of the course before, feel free to ask any questions. It's not like you're expected to know anything about the Course in Miracles. 
because the truth is the truth, and love is love, and the spirit is spirit. If you're just kind of, if you're new to the Course, and you're kind of intrigued by some things, please feel free to ask any question about A Course in Miracles, about any spirituality that you ever have encountered in your life, uh, from a religion to a esoteric spirituality. Uh, there are no questions that are taboo or off limits. You can ask any question that you like. There are no questions for me that are too personal or that are embarrassing. So my life is an open book, so you can ask me, and people do ask me, about everything. When I'm in South America, they will pull out, every, I mean, down to the most... I, was, I mean, I was down there teaching in South America, and they were like, you know, are you having sex? And, and I was like, not now. And they, so they got out passion fruit. They, they really thought that I was missing out. So they, they were getting the passion fruit out and trying to say, here, here's some more, here's some more. Mmm, ah, David, try. But they, nothing is too intimate, nothing is, is too uh, detailed or personal. Feel free, because we're all in this together, and truth wants to be openly revealed. There aren't any real secrets or mysteries. In fact, I have a friend who was a priest for years, and he would hear all these confessions from all these parishioners, and he would say that they would not only confess all that they've done, but they would ask him all these questions. And he said many of the questions that they asked, he had no answer for. He just, he thought, oh my God. So he would just tell them it's a divine mystery. Uh, that was his one answer. <laughs> Whenever he got to a tough question when he couldn't, he would just say, that's a divine mystery. And there we go, okay, thank you Father. But he said, I've listened to you David for years on MP3s and audio tapes and CDs and it's like you never even hesitate after someone asks you a question. It could even be the most difficult seeming question, like there's no possible way you would know the answer to that. And you just, it just pops up through your mouth like immediately. You don't even hesitate or, or have to ponder the question and, or shake, <coughs> scratch your head and go, oh that's a tough one. He said, so I, I really see that there's something going on that's a vibrant experience for you. And Tom also asked me to, to talk a little bit about A Course in Miracles and how it seemed to come into this realm. And especially if you're new to it, or if you're brand new to it. Uh, in 1965, in the United States, in New York City, this is like the manger story of 2,000 years ago, except uh, this is the, the modern day version of how Jesus came back to the world, so to speak. There were two psychologists at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City, and they lived a pretty typical, stressful life of living in a big city uh, and having a profession. Uh, she was married, and her collaborator, Bill, was her, her boss, and they were in a very stressful work setting, and basically, uh, one day her boss said, um, you, he said, we cannot continue living the way that we're living. It's just, it's too frustrating, it's too difficult and too painful. There has to be a better way of living in this world. And, and he was often talking to this woman named Helen, who was a colleague of his, in his department, and she would always like be very critical and most of the time very harsh, but this time she was uncharacteristically open and she said, you're right, Bill, and I'm going to help you find it, this better way. And then suddenly she started having psychic dreams, visual, very visual dreams that were in color, and, and a kind of a psychic phase that preceded this small, still voice, really like an inner dictation of thoughts, that said, this is the Course in Miracles, please take notes. And being a research psychologist, she was very, very, um, had a lot of anxiety. Psychologists generally lock people up or give them drugs that are hearing voices, uh, especially about, this is a Course in Miracles, please take notes. Uh, she was very nervous, but her colleague just stroked her arm and just kind of would say, just take it down. If it is crazy, we'll throw it away, and if it's, if it's not, then we'll just keep listening and keep taking it down. So that's how it started off. 
basically with his inner voice just saying, this is a Course in Miracles, it is a required course, and basically describing that free will does not mean that, that you can establish the curriculum, but it does mean that you can decide what you want to take at a given time. So that basically, we're all here to learn how to forgive or to release illusions from our mind and remember God's love. But we can't really even choose uh, the curriculum, you know, it's already determined. Forgiveness is, is the curriculum for everyone. And love is the, you might say, the outcome of following the curriculum. You, you clear away all the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence, and then what's left is love. You kind of peel the onion, you, or you clean the mirror, uh, clear, clean the mirror off so that the light can shine through, and then you realize that you are the light. Uh, you're not even the reflection of it, you are actually the light of God. So, so basically it's a self-study book. Uh, there, are, there are people that seem to be teachers of the book, although um, teaching is actually a demonstration of a state of mind. It, it, it's not words or merely words, it's actually a state of mind that can use the words. But it's more of a demonstration. Your attitude, like Jesus talked about the Beatitudes, your attitude is the teacher. So it doesn't matter who you're with, whether you're with a cat or a dog or a goat or a cow, or whether you're with a human being or you're with your computer. Uh, or, with, or a calculator. Uh, it doesn't really matter who or what you're with, uh, it's your state of mind that is teaching the whole universe what you believe you are. And when you open up and release these ego beliefs, you are kind of, we could say, transmitting or, or, or radiating and extending this vibration of divine love that is what God created is perfect and whole. But it takes a lot of clearing away of the obstacles. And that's what the Course is really about. It's about removing the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence. It doesn't even claim to teach. It says, this Course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love. For that is far beyond what can be taught. It's not a book that's saying, I will teach you how to love. It, would, it doesn't even go that far. It just says, I'm here, this presence is here to help you remove the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence. And then you will see how, how powerful and vast that you are, how perfect you are, how innocent you are, how you've never sinned, how you, you never had the ability to really make a mistake or be something other than the way God created you. You know, it's very loving. And so, now, if we bring it up to, to present day, uh, where I am with the course, I just recently have helped get the course down into South America, in a mass media edition, so that tens of thousands of people who want to read the book down there, who've been raised Catholic and, and want the real experience of Jesus, I've been involved with that, I've been involved with a lot of world travels, I do write answer emails on my global mailing list, about 3,300 people. Um, I travel where I'm invited and I also do like longer retreats and people just come and visit me. And we have a lot of rooms here. I noticed there's a room right across the hallway that just has a smaller table. So Tom was saying that you may want to set aside some time for like one-on-one -on -one talks because a lot of times there may be something you may want to just, just talk through and just bring up that you really don't feel like you want to bring it up uh, in the larger group. Like it still seems pretty intense or something you would rather not share at this point with, with everyone. You just want to kind of talk it through. I did that in uh, Australia. Mm -hmm. they, they, they opened up a span of time about like 3 o'clock, but there was like 30 or 40 participants. So, I don't know, I ended up going into the evening doing one-on-ones all, all afternoon and evening, but but Tom was just saying it would be mm -hmm. nice to make nice that to available. One-on-one -on -one with David, to everybody. maybe love five, ten minutes or something yeah. like that. And if it goes over or under, fine, you know. And that might happen today or tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, 
It depends on how many people. If if there's not so many, we could it could be half an hour where we just go walking off in the Irish countryside along the road, just out in the sunshine talking. And I've done. I was I was just down in Australia in Byron Bay, and they they were in this big barn, and then people would just go. We would go on these walks down this country road, up and down. About 15 minutes out and 15 minutes back, and I'd come back, the next one would come out of the barn. So it was like a, like a train. <laughs> but it was very relaxing, it was a warm, sunny day, and bright sunshine like this, and a beautiful <coughs> backdrop. So it doesn't have to be, you know, in a room, it can be anything. Now, um, while we're on the subject of how the book came about, um, would you tell us where it's at? And um, there was a query about copyright, etc. We could bring that up today and up to date, and then we'll <coughs> copy. Yes. Yeah. yeah the <coughs> originally, the first four participants were Helen, the scribe, who actually took the book down from Jesus shorthand, with a very powerful scribal ability. Uh, not to say that she wasn't nervous and anxious and had a lot of resistance. That's why it took seven years to get this book into this realm because. Jesus would say, what I just said was this, what you wrote was that. <laughs> Go back, and he had to do this over and over because the ego resistance to this divine love and light was enormous. And it took a lot of patience and a lot of time, seven years, to get this book in, into this realm. And that was just the shorthand notes. Then it was, there was a longer version called the Urtext, which had a lot of personal references. Jesus working with Helen and Bill about many of their own issues, sexuality and many things. Some of that stuff was edited out to make it more uh, acceptable. acceptable and helpful for, for the whole planet. Uh, <coughs> and then it was edited down. And then the book, they were told to copyright the book. And they thought, like most of us would think, like how do you apply for a copyright? for a book that's from Jesus. I mean, you know, you can't go into the copyright office in the United States and go, I say, okay, author, uh, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get out of here, get out of the office, you know, there's next, <laughs> next in line, you know. So they were guided to, they were told to put anonymous, uh, which in one sense, Jesus is kind of anonymous in this world. <laughs> it's a presence, it's not even, Christ is really not a man or a woman. It just seemed to speak through a man 2,000 years ago, but it's, it's universal love. It's not man or a woman. It's not masculine or feminine. It's, it doesn't have anything to do with duality. 